He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Voice of Tangaroa is a collaboration between New Zealand Geographic and RNZ. Reporting for this series is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air. There was a time when we humans thought the oceans were boundless. That there were more fish, more creatures, more life, more abundance than we could ever comprehend. Never mind impact. But we were wrong. Kia ora, no mai haramai. Hello and welcome to Voice of Tangaroa, a podcast series in which we explore the state of our oceans and the extraordinary variety of life that calls it home. Ko Claire Kincannon tēnei. Ko Kate Evans aho. I'm a freelance science journalist and I often write for New Zealand Geographic magazine. And I'm a producer and presenter of a weekly science and environment podcast, Our Changing World. And we're going to be working together to turn Kate's excellent journalism about the ocean into a podcast. Yeah, it's been fun. (laughs) As I've been writing these long-form feature articles for New Zealand Geographic, I've also been bringing radio gear along with me and trying really hard not to drop it into the ocean. Yeah, we appreciate that. (laughs) So where has this series taken you? I've been on a lot of boats. In the Hauraki Gulf, chasing manta rays. um, Off Napier on a trawler, talking about the environmental impacts of trawling. I've also talked to a lot of tangata whenua about kaimwana and what fishing rights mean to them. And I've sat in on community meetings where people grapple with the issue of invasive seaweeds taking over their bays. Sounds like some heavy topics. Are the stories really challenging to tell? Because, I mean, there's a lot of issues in the ocean right now. There are, but there's hope as well. It's not all doom and gloom. There's all kinds of interesting work being done around the country trying to find solutions to some of these problems. It's quite inspiring. And what about your own connection to the ocean? I grew up in Lee, uh, north of Auckland, and my childhood was basically filled with a lot of skinny dipping and snorkelling and finding weird treasures on the beach. But for the past two years while doing this work, I've definitely been paying a lot more attention to what's going on under the surface of the waves. And that's kind of where we're starting, right? Is about tuning in and listening and paying more attention. Yeah, it's about the undersea orchestra, the symphony of sound under the water, who's playing in it, why they're singing, and are we drowning them out? So where are we going to start? It's interesting that you ask about my personal connection to the ocean because we're actually going to start with someone very close to my heart. When I started putting out hydrophones at Lee, I started picking up uh, all sorts of noises. This is my dad, Joe Evans. In the early 1970s, he was a master's student at the University of Auckland's Lee Marine Laboratory, a half-hour walk in his homemade leather sandals from my childhood home. He still lives there today, and that's where we sit down to chat. Back then, he was studying the physics of underwater sound. You could hear the propeller noise from the fishing boats going out and from large ships out uh, in the channel between Lee and Little Barrier, Hotudu. And, and I picked up the what became known as the Dusk Chorus. The Navy were the first folks to use hydrophones in New Zealand, listening for the approach of enemy submarines off Aotea, Great Barrier Island, during World War II. They also detected this phenomenon every evening, just around dusk, quite a significant increase in the ambient sea noise, which was described as like frying fish in a frying pan sort of a scratchy sound and they didn't know what caused it. It would take the next student after my dad, Malcolm Castle, to point the finger at a spiky suspect. The theory was that the feeding parts of a sea urchin, well, it was called Aristotle's lantern. You'll sometimes find them on the beach. The mouth parts, there's a hole in the and the underside of the sea urchin, and five sharp teeth that come together in in the shape of a of an old fashioned lantern. Aristotle's lantern is such a great lantern, name. Um, would protrude through this hole and scrape algae off the rock. 
and that went into the gut of the of the animal and um, on mass made by hundreds of sea urchins feeding together at and the idea was that in doing that the the test which is what you would commonly call the shell of a of a sea urchin uh, is shaped like a, a flattened sphere and the action of the mouth parts would could set it ringing Sound travels faster and further underwater than through the air. This is what Dad was interested in. So his colleagues in the department built a hydrophone, basically an underwater microphone, which he attached to an underwater tower off Goat Island. We had to power them um, from the shore, so we had long cables um, up to about 600 metres where uh, you sent current down one pair of wires and they they ran uh, a little amplifier or pre-amplifier in the hydrophone housing itself and then the signal came back up the wire and there were lots of problems with that because uh, being such a long cable it was susceptible to interference electrical interference storms ripped the cables off the bottom too but they persevered capturing the underwater sounds on reel-to-reel tape recorders back at the lab of course technology has moved on in the 50 years since Today, it's much easier to record and analyse the music of the sea. But the mysteries of who exactly is singing those songs are still being unravelled. Every single time I open an audio file, I hear something new. Every time. And I've been, you know, looking at this for a while now. And there's just so little we know about it. This is Dr Jenny Stanley of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the University of Waikato. It's awesome. Like, it, it's kind of, it's crazy. People just say, "How doesn't that bother you? And I'm like, sometimes, but no, also not at all. Because I'm like, wow, that it's good to hear that there's a lot going on down there. She studies underwater soundscapes. So all of the layers of sound and how they change across time. Think of being on a bushwalk and the things you might hear. You kind of categorise them in your head, like, oh, you hear the wind and you hear the birds and you hear the river that you're walking past. It's kind of all that. It's like the biological, the abiotic, so the wind and the waves and the, you know, river, and then the aeroplane going overhead. Her colleague in underwater sound research, Professor Craig Radford from the University of Auckland, has some sciencey terms to group them. There's geophony... Natural sound, excluding animals. Rain on the surface, wind, waves, underwater earthquakes, underwater volcanoes, and then there's the biophony, so that's the sounds the animals make. So whales, classic example, dolphins, but also there's fish, and also more recently we're finding more and more crustaceans or the small animals making sound. And then there's anthrophony, all the noise that we're making. Recreational and commercial boats, large shipping vessels, trawling, dredging, and other sounds that are even more intrusive. Marine construction's a big one, pole driving. It's real impulsive and quite loud. Another activity that creates a lot of controversy is seismic surveying, so searching for oil and gas under the seabed. Uh, That creates a huge amount of noise. And of course, this last category of sound, anthrophony is increasing. Basically since the Industrial Revolution the underwater soundscapes have got noisier due to man-made um, noise and it's only really recently with, uh, with research that's shown that animals rely on sound for lots of different things that we're um, starting to understand what these effects of anthrophony are having on these marine animals. Ocean creatures make all kinds of sounds. Some you're probably familiar with. The haunting song of the humpback whale. Dolphins whistling to each other to communicate. Or echolocation clicks sperm whales use to find food. Others you might find surprising, like the groans, pops and creaks that are part of the southern right whale's repertoire. Or the interesting sounds that smaller animals make. Classic examples, John Dory, and they produce a sound that's been termed the bark because they basically sound like a dog. Gurnard's grunt. Another good example that we've recently found is the crustacean zip, 
and that basically sounds like doing up a zip on a jacket. What kind of crustaceans make a zip? Paddle crab. Oh, so that's the that New paddle crab sound. The New Zealand paddle crab. It's got some great sounds, doesn't it? So Several. they can produce three different types of sounds. Um, there's the zip, then there's a really low frequency sound that um, we term the bass, and then there's an, another sound called the rasp. Do we know how they make all the different sounds? We know that they make the rasp through their gastric teeth in the stomach. They just rub them together and it produces a rasp sound. The zip is um, produced by rubbing their first walking leg over their um, pincher claw because it's got ridges on it and it's basically like rubbing your finger down a comb. And the base, we've got no idea how they produce oh. that sound. I think I'm starting to see why Jenny Stanley gets so excited when she listens back to her hydrophone recordings. These sounds are amazing. Like the grunting gurnard. I, I love that. Who even knew? My favourite is the paddle crab. Yeah, like a one-man band. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but we don't necessarily know why they make the sound. Is that right? Yeah, in some cases we do, but in lots of cases we don't yet. There are so many ways that animals use sound and we're just starting to figure some of them out. For example, some of Jenny's previous research was investigating how sound could influence tiny little crab larvae. If you play a habitat sound from a healthy habitat that they would grow up in, you could get metamorphosis or the, you know, the molt into the next juvenile faster than if you played... Um, habitat sound from a habitat that they wouldn't live in or compared to a silent control. But that's just one thing at one point in their lives. Finding food, wooing mates, coordinating spawning, avoiding predators, keeping track of their babies, intimidating rivals, navigating, communicating. We know fish, mammals and crustaceans use underwater sound for all of these. So it's a riot of sound down there. Like, here's one of Jenny's hydrophone recordings. Every pop, snap and crackle is being made by someone or something. But it's difficult in a vibrant undersea world like this, with a chorus happening, to match the sound with the musician. Often it's down to serendipity, says Craig. Like, we see it or we hear it underwater, we'll go catch the animal, put it in a tank, put it in a hydrophone and we'll get them making the noise. Just through natural observation, really. Uh, the paddle crab's a good example. They were in a tank for a field course, and I was down in the tank room one day, and I heard these funny sounds, and just poked my head over the top, and there was a crab, like, doing the zip. So then we just put a hydrophone in with them, and we found out they produce all these three different types of sounds. So the paddle crabs and others are down there jamming out, zipping and barking and whistling. And I guess you're going to get to this. What happens when we drive a boat past? Or a ship? Or do some pile driving to build a marina? Are we ruining their day or their lives? Is it like a leaf blower going outside your window that stresses you out? Or is it like an airport being built by your house that just forces you to move or something? Well, yeah, they evolved in a quieter ocean without the cacophony that we're adding. So they're not used to it. There's a sliding scale to how our noise impacts them. You know, at the very far end of the scale, cause them to die, like through rupturing organs and stuff. And then, and then the scale gets less, but the effects get more wide. Like you can go through, animals become deaf or they have temporary threshold shifts. Um, and then what we're really looking at is more of the behavioural changes, how the sound masks or disrupts um, communication signals. So you can think of that as like the cocktail party effect, right? If you're at a loud party, in order to communicate over distance, you either have to be louder or you have to be closer together. So those are the types of effects that are probably more common and more of what the animals actually have to deal with. So ideally, you'd record in the same place with and without human activity, right? And then you would see what the difference is. How do you get everybody to stop driving boats around long enough to do this? Well, lucky timing played a part in this too. Go hard and go early or risk losing tens of thousands of lives. The Prime Minister said today that it was time to ramp up the nation's response to COVID-19 to stop its spread. 
Craig's PhD student at the time, Louise Wilson, and a colleague, Dr Matthew Pine, had been studying the impact of small boat noise and had hydrophones out in various places in Te Kapa Moana, Te Moana Nui Atoi, the Hauraki Gulf. We've done a lot of work on shipping because it's easy to do. Large ships have to carry AIS so they, you can track where they go and what they're doing, what speeds they're doing. But in a, in a place like the Hauraki Gulf where boat ownership is huge, there's potentially a greater effect of that than what the shipping activity does because it's just the sheer volume and numbers of boats that are out on the water. And because we can't track them um, like we do with ships, we have to come up with alternate ways in which to try and figure out their contribution to the overall soundscape. And to do that, we coupled the hydrophones with um, land-based cameras. So whenever the hydrophone turned on to record, we could get a panoramic picture of what boats were around at the time. And we were then able to um, run AI on the cameras and then on the sound data and match that activity up. So when lockdown got announced, we basically went out the next day, um, swapped all the hydrophones over, put fresh batteries and um, memory in them. We are all now preparing as a nation to go into self-isolation. Staying at home is essential. The ocean basically went quiet from man-made activity and we got a real good baseline of what the ocean actually sounds like without a lot of human input. So we got some really nice kind of, if you like, natural seascapes of what it would be like without human interference. We could hear over a wider area because there was a lot less noise in the Gulf so we did some um, modelling of that data. We took uh, a dolphin as a marine mammal example and the big eye fish as, as a fish example and we were able to model and show that their hearing range, the distance that they could hear over, um, significantly increased compared to what it was pre-lockdown. At the Aha Aha Rocks north of Waiheke, it was estimated that the range of dolphins' calls and whistles increased from about three kilometres to nearly four. Before lockdown in the Rangitoto Channel, big eye fish would have to be within just a few metres to hear each other's strange popping noises. Without the noise pollution of boats, their acoustic range soared to nearly 155 metres. In the end, Louise's research did show that the small boats are having an impact, shorter term than the larger container ships because they move faster, but there are also way more of them, creating a near constant hum of boat noise every day at all sites that she studied. How might we need to change our own behaviours now that we know this? Well, that's the million-dollar question, right? Are you going to stop Auckland <laughs> people, especially New Zealand, where we have such a strong affinity to the ocean, not driving boats on it? I, I can never advocate for that because I quite we to do our research we need to drive boats, but there's um, other ways in which we can do that, and marine reserves is a good example. Marine reserves are typically being established to protect animals from fishing pressure, but we can also use them to protect them from sound. It's a lot harder because one of the main draw cards with marine reserves is people are encouraged to drive their boats in them and to go diving, but maybe we put some restrictions around the speeds boats are allowed to go in there or or have zones in there where boats aren't allowed to go. Just just being a bit more creative with the way we think about um, marine protection. Jenny Stanley agrees. Internationally now, underwater noise is considered a marine pollutant, right? But in New Zealand, we are kind of missing that key piece in the protection puzzle without just producing a knee-jerk reaction fix. We do need to better understand our influence on the soundscape. But like Craig said, you know, it's just working together. It's not eliminating activities. It's working together with the science and the industry and recreation. You know, things like reducing speed limits in an area, yeah, especially in marine reserves and sensitive areas. We know there's spawning fish here. We know there's marine mammals raising young. We need to slow down here. We can reduce that output. Um, if there's some sensitive areas around shipping lanes, these can be rerouted. It's been done in Stalwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary where we knew there were right whales and humpbacks feeding. They actually rerouted the vessel lanes outside of there. So Stalwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary is off the coast of Boston City. 
through Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, Jenny's been involved in a project recording at marine sanctuaries across the US to better understand the soundscapes there. But she's also been working on this at a few sites around New Zealand, the first step towards understanding our influence on the soundscapes here. One of her sites is the Moor Titi Marine Protection Area. This isn't a dock marine reserve. It's been established by the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. It's on three submerged reefs around Motiti Island, which sits 11 kilometres off Papamoa Beach, near Tauranga. And obviously those areas are hugely influenced by the port. And this, you know, Tauranga port is now, I think, number one in terms of input and, you know, kind of traffic into New Zealand. I think it's rivaling wow. Auckland at this point. And, and, you know, some of my sites are just low frequency, constant shipping traffic noise. So basically the, the the container ships coming into port, the container ships holding out there, waiting for their berth to be ready, waiting for their labour to be ready. And if they're in port, they're spending more money. So they just kind of wait out there, you know, just coming and going, low frequency, chronic noise. And it will be really interesting to look at how that has spread through, it is spreading through the Marine Reserve and looking at over kind of a temporal pattern and seeing is it all year round what animals is it influencing how loud is it and how could that be masking communication or affecting reproduction or causing stress in the animals living in these areas i wonder though kate what can we do about that noise pollution from the port i mean shipping is massive for an island nation like aotearoa new zealand it's not like we can just stop container ships There actually are some potential solutions. Some were suggested in a 2021 science journal article that Craig contributed to. For example, propellers are responsible for about 85% of shipping noise. If we redesign those to avoid cavitation, which is the formation of small bubbles in the water that's really noisy, that would improve fuel efficiency while also dramatically reducing shipping noise. So we're transitioning to electric motors. So are we doing these things? Mm, Both solutions are pretty expensive, and there are no national regulations or international agreements encouraging shipbuilding companies to transition so far. And it's early days. Jenny's just at the start of this monitoring, and there are a few things she wants to puzzle out. Which animals are living there, and are they sensitive to underwater sound? Do they use sound? So one, can they hear? What can they hear? Two, do they make sound? Do they use sound? Do they listen to sound? And then um, you can grossly, you know, not every single species we understand their hearing and um, sound production capabilities, but we can grossly lump them in with kind of certain invertebrates, crustaceans, fishes, marine mammals. And there has been quite a lot done on kind of looking at the impacts of sound and certain sound levels on, say, fishes and, say, marine mammals. Mm -hmm. And are those locations a really important place for certain key Uh, life stages do they reproduce there do they spawn there you know a lot of spawning fish use um acoustic cues to to time spawning release things like Mm -hmm. that you know green mammals are very social they like to you know chatter and stuff is masking their potential communication space going to be an issue for these key periods and using that for better management hopefully this information can then be used to better manage these areas This is her ultimate goal, that underwater sound recording could be used to check which animals are there and help us decide how to look after them. She also has sites in Fiordland that she's recording at. But it's a huge amount of data, and there's still some improvements in the analysis side of things to be done to be able to answer all her questions. We can use it now for change. It's definitely indicative change. So if you get a change from a macroalgae-dominated reef to an urchin-dominated reef over the space of six months, the soundscape will most definitely change and our current analyses will detect that. But yeah, but better understanding some of these smaller key players and, you know, tricky little things is something that I think the field needs to work on. Recordings can be converted to spectrograms, images of the sound that you can train AI to scan through and spit back out what species was making what sound at what time. To help this side of things, Craig and Jenny are part of a group calling for the development of something delightfully called GLUBS. The Global Library of Underwater Biological Sounds. So this is a new initiative and it's part of an international working group that I'm part of. And what we're trying to do is build a database that people can then put their sounds into which will make identifying potential sounds Um, a lot easier if there's a bunch of known sounds that we can then go through. A classic example is the Cornell 
bird library. It's, it's an amazing um, database of bird song. And if there's a centralised location that people can go to and type in a species name and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of sounds that come up for these animals, not only does it allow you to identify potential unknown signals in your own data, but it also aids in um, being able to develop these AI techniques because the more known sounds that you have, uh, the better your training of your system is going to be, the more accurate it's going to be at pulling out the sounds in your data. Gloves is such a perfect name. But I mean, when you talk about using cameras and training AI and the wireless hydrophones of built-in memory that researchers can just leave out in remote sites. It's a bit different to your dad's day, hey? Yeah, actually, a friend of his took this neat picture around the time of his research that I used for the New Zealand Geographic article. And it's a bunch of students hauling a little tinny heaped full of cables down at the beach. Like, it's so full of cables. You can see them in shirts and those 70s shorts with shaggy windblown hair and beards. And they're just straining against it, really putting their backs into it. Just for this one hydrophone. Yeah, wild. But now all these advances mean lots of opportunities, not just for checking what critters are there. Craig is currently working on another project that would involve live streaming underwater audio to help catch people fishing where they shouldn't be. Marine compliance is a big task, especially marine reserves. You don't often have people out out in the reserves watching all the time for illegal activity. Nights are a good time for people to go poach if they really wanted to do it. So being able to listen and hear boats could potentially provide a way that we can monitor these locations. So what we're doing is we're developing some, um, going back to AI, trying to develop the AI to firstly detect the boats and then secondly to classify the boats and potentially classify their activity. So boats typically have acoustic signatures, so different boats will sound um, different to other boats. And if a boat's fishing, it'll sound different to a boat that's just driving by. So if we can listen and, and classify those signals and then send those detections through satellite and alert the appropriate people that there's potentially something a foul going on, then they can then decide whether they want to go check it out or whether mm. it's just a... Almost like an alarm going off, like incursion, yeah. incursion. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. How far advanced is that? Uh, We're in the AI phase at the moment. We've developed the system. Um, We now need to develop the AI. Like train it to do what you need it to do. Yeah, so we can detect boats. We have a pretty good detection accuracy. It's the classification of the different boats. So we need to go out and record a bunch of different boats doing different things so the classifier can then learn what different things sound like. And sound is also being used in restoration for undersea real estate advertising. In the tropics, people have been building basically coral gardens and to attract the fish back to those replanted coral gardens, they're replaying sound to try and um, make the process go a lot quicker than naturally. And it, that's, that's shown promise. What they're doing is saying, hey, there's a coral garden here, this is what it should sound like and you guys should come along and settle because there's space and it's nice. There are still instruments to identify, players to name, but listening to the underwater symphony might soon be a way of assessing and helping the health of different ocean ecosystems. And though our noisy lives do negatively impact marine critters, the good thing about sound pollution is that once we decide to turn the volume down, the problem is immediately gone. When humans went quiet during the lockdowns, nature was in full voice. The sea is still singing, if we shut up long enough to hear it. That was science journalist Kate Evans, who researched and reported this story for New Zealand Geographic. She spoke to her dad, Joe Evans, and to Dr. Jenny Stanley of the University of Waikato and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and Professor Craig Radford of the University of Auckland. Voice of Tangaroa is a joint production between RNZ's Our Changing World and New Zealand Geographic. 
New Zealand Geographic reporting on the voice of Tangaroa is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand on air. You can learn more and read the articles for free at nzgeo.com forward slash seas. Kate Evans and Richard Robinson are the main journalist and photographer of the series, and additional reporting was done by Bill Morris. This episode was produced by Kate Evans and me, Claire Kincannon, with help from Ellen Rikers and Brianna Uritich. Thanks to Phil Vine for editing help. Sound engineering was by William Saunders, and executive producers are Tim Walken of RNZ and James Frankham of New Zealand Geographic. Additional thanks to Craig Radford, Jenny Stanley, Will Raymond, Trudy Webster, Martha Guetta and Steve Dawson for hydrophone recordings used in this episode. Original music for this series was created by the Wellington-based group Grains. You can find them on Spotify. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Tēnā koe i mai. Thanks so much for listening. Ko Clark and Kananaho. Mā te wā.